Hi there, I'm Johannes Keating. Today's topic is ISTDP informed couples therapy. Two things come to mind when I think about this subject. The first is a memory from about 2011. I was spending some time with my then teacher and supervisor, Marvin Squirman. He's not retired, but I was picking his brain about the subject matter. And he said, well, you gotta remember, with individual therapy, the aim is to help people get to the bottom of their neurotic suffering, but not so much with couples therapy. With couples therapy, we accept that we're dealing with two crazy people, or three if we include ourselves, and the aim is simply to help them work out a better relationship, not to get to the bottom of neurotic suffering. So that's been a guiding principle in my work with couples ever since. Now, the second memory that comes to mind, a uh, colleague and I, Matt Swager, we were driving out somewhere out into the wilderness to see an old Davenloo student, one of the hanger honors who had been with him for just years and years. I think he did eventually get excommunicated like so many others. Uh, anyway, we spent a few hours with this individual, saw some of his work. He showed some couples therapy. And I remember thinking, this is just atrocious. He was simply ignoring the lad. He was focusing on the gal uh, and trying to help her have an unlocking. He was basically doing a vertical, unremitting approach with the gal while the uh, fella is just sitting by passively, completely disengaged. In his therapeutic focus, there was absolutely no connection uh, to the presenting problems, to what they had said they wanted help with. Uh, instead, he was just pushing for this unlocking. Uh, and uh, there was no effort at all. Uh, to help the couple see their own individual contributions to the emotional distancing between them. So I was not very impressed, and I thought there's got to be a better way. Uh, I spent about the next decade or so training uh, with Marvin Scorman, getting audiovisual supervision, and a bulk of that uh, was um, in couples therapy. So uh, I'm going to go over a PowerPoint presentation and try to share uh, the um, distilled essence of what I learned over that decade when it comes to ISTDP informed couples therapy. Uh, this presentation is dedicated to Eric Schneider, uh, a really bright clinician who has been uh, pushing me uh, to do this. So here it is. ISTDP informed couples therapy. This will be a Scorman-Keating amalgamation perspective. Scorman is the last name of my former teacher. Keating is my last name. Uh, I've really incorporated what he taught me, but then I've also elaborated upon it. So I'm calling it a Scorman-Keating amalgamation perspective. So overview, I will get into ISTDP and couples therapy, how the two go together. Uh, my background and training in couples therapy my guesstimated track record as a couples therapist. I'll discuss the aims of my form of ISTDP informed couples therapy. I will discuss the basic or foundational assumptions that comprise the premise whereupon I base my practice of couples therapy, including basic nuts and bolts issues when it comes to this way of doing things. I will discuss and give examples of what Marvin Scorman used to call crystallizing, what I sometimes call anchoring interventions. And I will explain the special importance of this way of working. Uh, I will discuss the different phases of treatment. I will offer brief, de-identified, let me stress, de-identified uh, transcripts, uh, excerpts of transcripts and examples of my interventions with uh, four different couples uh, that capture important elements of how I practice ISTDP informed couples therapy. Uh, again, the transcripts are all de-identified and they are inspired by very difficult uh, cases, difficult couples from over seven years ago that took place in a community mental health setting. Um, and I think one of the last transcripts, I called them Amanda and Mick, um, there, that highlights a case where I just wasn't able to help the couple very much at all. Uh, their relationship was characterized by a whole lot of instability and chaos, uh, but I think it'll be interesting to showcase that. And more generally, I think it's important that uh, those in a teaching capacity um, discuss work that didn't go so well. Uh, so uh, there's a lot to learn from difficult cases. 
Uh, my about nine year stint in community mental health was one hell of an education. When you work with really disturbed people, um, it just uh, it, it just really, really helps in terms of improving your skill set. And then when you work with people that are less disturbed, well, you're going to be that much better. So let's get one thing right. Habib Davenlu, he did not work with couples, though he had in 1986 Saul, Dr. Saul Brown, uh, write an article about family therapy in the International Journal. Uh, that was quite an interesting article. Uh, if you're interested and you don't have access to it, shoot me an email. I'll make sure you get a copy. Um, adaptations to couples therapy in terms of ISTDP, um, it's done by different people. Uh, I'm not personally aware of any published outcome uh, data. Uh, there certainly is none in what I do, which makes what I do experimental. Uh, people have taken this in different directions, though. Marvin Squirman, he adapted it in his way. I incorporated his approach, and then I elaborated on it. Roughly 30% of my approximately 800 hours of supervision with Marvin Squirman uh, was centered on couples therapy. Uh, the stint of training was from 2012 to 2021. So uh, I personally do not methodically collect uh, outcome data. So feel free to take what I'm going to say now with a grain of salt. Uh, but my rough estimate is that a, over a nine-year period where couples have comprised anywhere from 20 to 40% of my caseload, only about seven or eight couples have not been helped at all whereas the vast majority are either significantly or moderately helped and reach their goals in anywhere between eight and 30 sessions. Uh, I estimate that half of those uh, that I have not been able to help would probably not benefit from any couples therapy as uh, there was either substance use involved, too much instability in their lives, uh, or their goals fell outside of what couples therapy can really help with. For example, they wanted help not getting triggered or wanting to make sure the other person never gets upset. And then the other half of the folks that I was not able to help, I am sure it had to do with limitations of my skill set. So I roughly estimate that with the exception of these seven or eight couples that I have not been able to help at all, 60% uh, have major improvements and leave treatment extremely satisfied. 20% experience moderate improvement, not significant improvement, but moderate. And perhaps 20% experience only mild improvement. Couples where the treatment facilitates a breakup or a divorce, I actually often consider this successful. So for example, if as part of the treatment, I'm able to help clarify that say partner A really does not aspire to give up treating partner B poorly, and I'm able to help partner B open their eyes to this fact, and partner B then ends up leaving the relationship with partner A as a result, I consider that a successful course of treatment. And I'm lumping these cases into the significant and moderate improvement categories and estimate that this occurs in about 15% of my couples therapy cases. Informed consent is very important. Uh, in writing and verbally, uh, clarify before the start of treatment that couples therapy sometimes leads to the dissolution of the relationship and that if one or both change, there is no guarantee that the other will like them more. They could end up liking them less. Uh, this holds true for all people in the client's life. The people in their life could end up liking them less if they change, uh, if they become more assertive, less docile, less compliant, etc. So I spell that out in writing in my informed consent form, and I also uh, mention that verbally in my meet and greet with uh, prospective uh, couples. So by the way, if you want a copy of my informed consent form, just give me a holler. I'll make sure you get a copy. It is quite thorough, if I may say so myself. I've had a lawyer look over it, so I'm quite pleased with my informed consent form. Uh, just let me know if you'd like a copy. Many of the couples that I work with actually do not consent uh, to allow me to use the videotaped sessions for teaching purposes. Uh, that and the fact that a lot of good couples therapy actually uh, do not necessarily make for very good or exciting TV. Uh, you know, the, the work that involves laying the groundwork through thorough inquiry can be a rather painstaking process. Uh, 
So for these two reasons, I have yet to put on a workshop exclusively showcasing couples work. Hopefully that will change in the future and I will be able uh, to do that. Uh, I think we're primed in the ISTDP community to really expect uh, fireworks and dramatic unlockings. And as you will soon learn, that's not a major focus in this way of doing uh, couples therapy. Um, so I'm just thinking it's not very exciting TV. Uh, but anyway, the aim uh, in this form of couples therapy is to establish emotional intimacy by addressing barriers, that means defense mechanisms, to emotional intimacy and facilitating insight into their respective core conflicts while supporting the autonomy and authenticity of each, of each partner. We seek to facilitate the experience where each partner no longer feels alone in their feelings, while at the same time, they remain totally autonomous. Genuine and reciprocal statements of, I can understand why you feel that way and I don't blame you is often where couples end up when their distancing defenses have been restructured. We aim to assist each partner to gain perspective on their own experience, and when applicable, understand the historic roots of their emotions so that the other only gets their fair share of the emotions. So for example, if an anger reaction appears disproportionate and not commensurate to the immediate trigger, Parsing the emotion, helping the partner parse the emotion can be very helpful. So for example, uh, helping them see that 10% of my anger is really with you to the partner, whereas 90% really is for my dad. That can be an important intervention. Each partner is an individual and we never encourage one to be an extension of the other. We always check in to see if the other agrees or disagrees. Recalls a described event the same or differently, has overlapping or divergent priorities from the partner. We aim to help the couple have a better relationship. And in some cases, for one partner to open their eyes to the fact that their partner treats them poorly and is not likely to change. Again, we do not necessarily aim for major character change and a total resolution of neuroses. Unlocking of the unconscious is not a major aim in this version of ISTDP informed couples therapy. Like I alluded to earlier, it can happen, but we don't push for that. Uh, so because of that, there really is less of a need to be hyper-focused on the microanalysis, the microanalysis of the rise of the feelings, or trying to maintain that rise, or uh, being hyper-focused on unconscious uh, signals. Now and then, unlockings happen. If a partner comes in and they're furious, highly mobilized, their hands are going like this, and we know that the other partner uh, would not be blown out of the water by an unlocking, we might just say, what do those hands want to do? And with that little nudge, that could usher in and facilitate an unlocking. So if it's right on the surface and all they need is a little nudge, and their partner is not fragile or would not uh, be blown out of the water, then yes, we could just nudge a little bit and facilitate an unlocking of the unconscious. But that happens spontaneously and organically. We do not necessarily push for that in this form of doing ISTDP informed couples therapy. Uh, we work towards creating a two-person relationship by honing in on the true and subjectively authentic perspectives priorities and feelings of each partner while helping each communicate this truth in a way that is emotionally intimate rather than distancing. Change happens through repeated exposure to emotional contact and the experiential here and now focus on their immediate experience along with insight into the obstacles, the defenses, and their psychodynamic conflicts. So, for example, this really amounts to greater self-understanding of their own triangles of conflict and person. A low to medium measure of rise in affect while having a focus on the couple's defenses, that appears actually very much to be a primary mechanism of change as far as what I have observed over the years. Change also happens as the couple learn new skills. There's a behavioral component. Yes, there is. 
in seeing the therapist model emotional intimacy through live commentary and simulated behavioral points of contrast that help the couple distinguish feelings and intimacy from anxiety and defensive behavior. Uh, this is both behavioral and insight-based. What may look like mere behavioral suggestions actually have a restructuring effect in that in addition to teaching skills, uh, these suggestions mobilize feelings due to the implied emotional intimacy in the suggestions. And again, they drive home the distinction between feelings and intimate expressions of feelings from anxiety and defensive ways of relating. An example of a behavioral point of contrast, a therapist. So you're angry, but you deal with that anger by talking down to her. Do you think the odds of her being there for you would be better if you would calmly express your anger in a sentence or two, explain why you're angry? End of quote. So this paints a contrasting picture where an intimate expression of anger contrasts with a defensive approach of talking down to his partner. This helps differentiate the feeling from the way the feeling is handled, which would be the defense. Behavioral suggestions and simulated points of contrast also amount to a form of portraiting emotional intimacy, which gives voice to and fleshes out longings for closeness, and also insofar as individuals and couples are defended against uh, mixed feelings about closeness, defenses will also be mobilized. Change happens when each partner sees their own role in the problems and the distancing and turns against their distancing behaviors in favor of emotional intimacy. When the therapist proposes that one partner change defensive ways of relating in favor of a more emotionally intimate way of relating, an effort is made to help the partner in question see how this could improve their own life uh, and that this change may be something that they would want to work towards regardless of whether or not the relationship works out or not. This ensures genuine as opposed to compliance buy-in and it delivers the critical message that each partner cannot, cannot change themselves as a favor to the other person. Each partner needs to have reason and motivation to change because it's more important to them than it is to anybody else. Sometimes I, when I see this dynamic in play where one partner is trying to change themselves uh, to please, to placate the other person, I will say, look, you can help someone rearrange their furniture. You can give them a, a ride to the airport. You can lend them money. You can uh, make them dinner. Those are the kinds of things you can do as a favor to someone else. But changing how you deal with your own emotions, that's a no-go. You can't do that as a favor to someone else. That is too deep and too fundamental to how you are in the world. Those are the sorts of things you cannot do as a favor to someone else. The couple tend to mobilize each other's feelings um, just by virtue of the issues that bring them in for couples therapy. They're often pissed at each other. And so they will mobilize each other's feelings, uh, which reduces the need for the therapist to apply strong pressure. So to reiterate, since therapeutic gains tend to occur in the absence of dramatic unlockings and instead through the repeated exposure to real emotional contact and a measure of affect, we do not need to be hyper-focused on the level of rise of emotion or signals from the unconscious in this modality. Uh, unlockings are not the aim, though they can certainly happen like I outlined earlier. So that's not the main focus. There is, of course, some tracking of signals and some monitoring of unconscious cues and uh, taking the, the pulse of the unconscious to some extent, but that's really in the background. It's not in the foreground. It's not uh, the main focus in this form of couples therapy. So this format of ISTDP informed couples therapy is not about doing parallel individual therapy uh, with each while the other one is watching from a disengaged or voyeuristic position, like I mentioned in my opening. Uh, that is not what this form of ISTDP couples therapy is about. 
There might, however, be stretches, of course, uh, of a couple's therapy sessions where one partner is uh, the main focus and sits in the hot chair, so to speak. Uh, but if this is done well, the other partner will not feel left out and will still feel very engaged, actually. Uh, generally, we facilitate a balanced focus between the partners, where after the focus has been on one partner for an extended duration, we turn to the other and check in. How are you reacting to this? So generally, we try to have a sort of a balanced sort of tennis situation where it goes from one to the other. Um, but of course, there are stretches where one uh, is more in the hot chair, uh, for example, if they are more defensive, then they get more attention. Emotional intimacy consists of authentic ways of relating that are stripped of defensive ways of relating. This typically has two components. The first is conveying the essential message. That was a term I learned from Eric Schneider. The essential message of your own perceptions and emotional responses. So the perception, the interpretation, and the emotional response uh, and the other component, the other side of the equation when it comes to emotional intimacy is acknowledging the other's essential message as being reasonable based on who the other person is. Emotionally intimate ways of relating requires an absence of reactivity and that each is owning their experience and engaging from a place that isn't obligatory, compliant, or defiant. Full emotional intimacy requires an understanding response, but not an agreement that is essential, not an agreement uh, of the other's essential message. But we assume that there will be times when one or both partners are simply too angry or too defensive, uh, too reactive to have access to an empathetic state of mind, in which case the most emotionally intimate and authentic response might be look, I'm sorry, right now I'm too angry or hurt or anxious to be able to lean into your experience and be supportive, but we can try again in an hour. An example of emotional intimacy in the absence of agreement. Again, emotional intimacy does not require that you agree with the other person. This is very important. So uh, here would be an example, quote, I don't remember this event the same way you do, and I disagree with how you're characterizing my behavior, but if that's how you remember what happened and what I did, no wonder you're angry with me. So here, the spirit is one where everyone is open to the idea that reasonable people can disagree and have a different recollections of events. Here is a situation where we give the other person the benefit of the doubt, uh, that we allow for the possibility that their perceptions might be accurate, uh, may contain merit, and for the possibility that our recollections and our perceptions could be wrong. If it becomes clear, however, that one partner is not approaching the relationship or the treatment uh, in a spirit of good faith, then we have to address that, of course. Uh, that does happen sometimes. Uh, couples therapy uh, might be contraindicated if it leads to abuse after sessions are over, where one partner punishes the other for having been critical in front of the therapist. So in situations of abuse, uh, couples therapy can actually be contraindicated. Uh, couples therapy assumes that both partners have a role in the problems uh, that they're experiencing. We're always looking for the ways in which both, both partners contribute to emotional distancing. If it appears that one partner is primarily responsible for the problems, or if the couple sees it this way, then we suggest individual therapy and explain that the premise of couples therapy is that both have a role in the problems. The therapist only weighs in to confirm a perception if the perception is obviously true and occurring in real time in session. For example, you know, she's describing you as combative and argumentative, and, and that's actually how you are in here too. So I agree with her. You really do tend to become argumentative and combative. In line with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we assume a base level of stability is needed to engage in therapy. If a client doesn't have, let's say, running water, electricity, a working internet for virtual sessions, if that's uh, what's happening, uh, worried about where their next meal is coming from, et cetera, uh, couples therapy and often therapy in general 
uh, is contraindicated. Uh, case management, perhaps some supportive therapy, yes. Uncovering exploratory theory, therapy, not so much. We assume that it's important to help couples distinguish between what they can reasonably expect from the other and what really amounts to or should amount to asking for a favor. When what ought to be a request for a favor is expressed as something a partner is entitled to, this amounts to treating the other as if they were an extension of the self. So an example of not doing that, uh, instead doing the right thing uh, and making sure that it's expressed as a favor would be this. I know it's your choice, but I would sleep better if I know that you would be willing to return the library books on time this time. I know that's not as important to you as it is to me. So this would certainly be you doing me a favor. Except in parenting situations and in certain specific situations where agreements have been made, partners comprising couples should never give up their autonomy. Parenting is different. Uh, the child, uh, the parent really is an extension of the child's needs in many ways. If a child needs their diapers changed in the middle of the night, uh, a parent is not autonomous. They need to go and change the diaper. So parenting is an exception. Uh, if you have made certain agreements and promises, though that's exceptions. But by and large, it's never ever appropriate to give up your autonomy for your partner. What one can reasonably expect, however, of your partner is that the other give serious weight and consideration to your feelings and needs, that the other factor in your feelings and needs and preferences in their decision-making process uh, that they do not simply make unilateral choices, uh, that they allow for a we instead of a just a me. Uh, but no one is entitled to the other's obedience. Let's get that right. We assume that anger is the felt sense of not liking something, of disliking, and that this is a commonplace experience and that this can happen even if the other has not done something technically wrong. Emotional intimacy, therefore, requires an openness to whatever we and the other feels, regardless of whether or not the emotions appear rational. We assume it is important and helpful, however, to distinguish between the category of anger at the other when the other has not done anything wrong. For example, it just makes me mad when I hear you chew your food that way versus the category of anger when the other actually has done something wrong. For example, violated an agreement or engaged in very inconsiderate and hurtful behavior. So for example, look, I know that you're not doing anything wrong per se, but it makes me so mad when you play and fidget nervously with your lips in that way. Versus, look, we had an agreement that you would take out the trash and you haven't followed up on that for days. I'm so mad at you for violating our agreement. It's critical that it's clear to both partners that when they express negative emotions towards the other, that the intention is to take down walls and to increase closeness. If intentions are in question and if one or both partners believe that the other might be weaponizing the framework of emotional closeness, it becomes imperative, well, first of all, to sort that out if that really is the case and address it. But if it's not actually the case, uh, to uh, offer qualifications such as the only reason I'm sharing this with you is to bring us closer, not to punish you or make you feel bad. The only intention, the only reason I'm bothering to share this with you is to make sure that I'm not putting up a wall, to make sure that I'm doing my part and not putting up a wall. If uh, one partner continues to feel like an emotionally intimate expression of anger doesn't lead to emotional closeness, it must be explained that in that event, it would not make sense for the other to continue to share their negative feelings towards the other. This can be explored by asking, is there any way that she can let you know that she's angry with you that would actually work for you? If the answer is no or just unreasonable, it needs to be clarified that this will likely amount to a permanent barrier between them and that the one is actually asking the other to be voiceless when it comes to their negative feelings towards the other. We assume that turn-taking is important 
and that if whose turn it is to try to be heard and understood is not clearly delineated, the interaction can easily devolve into a tit for tat where both try to convey their essential message at the same time, resulting in no one feeling heard or understood and the entire interaction resulting in a bickering mush. We assume that it's commonplace for people to have mixed feelings when a partner begins to engage and exhibit long desired behaviors. What took you so long? Along with anticipating that the new behavior will not be maintained in the future, often constitute the negative feelings when a partner begins to change for the better. Along with also gratitude and appreciation for the new desired behavior typically. We assume that it's imperative to facilitate an awareness of and an expression of such mixed feelings in real time as these dynamics become activated in session. Conflict and differences are unavoidable, but the couple can learn how to navigate conflict and differences to further closeness as opposed to distance. So for example, if one partner conveys that their feelings are more important than the other's feelings, that's distancing, that's repelling. The other can very much be responsible for what we feel, but as adults, we are 100% responsible for how we deal with our emotions. So blaming your partner for the fact that you drink to excess, that's a no-go. The therapeutic focus always connects to their day-to-day -day struggles and priorities for treatment. Uh, the couple should at all times be able to see and understand how the therapeutic focus connects to their relational struggles and problematic relational patterns. Uh, when there is indications that someone is cognitively disorganized or drifting, we regulate anxiety. However, I found that simply by keeping a tight focus on the barriers to closeness and each of their triangles while inviting each to clarify their perspectives and their experience, that often does a sufficient job of regulating anxiety. Uh, where we don't actually have to be hyper-focused on this. If a session spirals out of control because of arguments, bickering, and severe defensiveness, the therapist needs to take charge and compassionately but forcefully interject with things like, the session is getting away from us, one at a time, look at me, no, no, not at each other, one at a time, look at me, and in no more than a sentence or two, explain to me what you're angry at your partner for. No interruptions. You'll both get your turn. But for now, don't look at each other. Look at me. You start one or two sentences. Just explain to me what you're angry at him for. You're going to get your turn. Hold on. You're going to get your turn. Now, now it's you. Okay, that sort of a thing. Um, an excerpt from the informed consent form that I have couples sign. Quote, if one or both members of the couple become combative, I will bypass content and focus on process. In these type of instances, I'll generally not focus on what is being said, but on how things are being said and the underlying state of mind that drives the combative behavior. If the combative behavior continues, I will generally disengage with a combative partner and focus my attention exclusively on the member of the couple who's able to dialogue. Dialogue, the act of acknowledging and reflecting on the other's point of view before sharing your own opinion, is a prerequisite for any counseling session. Once and if the member who remained in a combative state is able to productively re-engage in dialogue again, my focus will return to both members. As a general rule, couples with lower ego adaptive capacity require that the therapist give less latitude and that the therapist provide more structure. So for example, if someone like that is becoming long-winded, the therapist needs to interject with things like, no, I don't need to hear all of these things, all of these details, just in a couple of sentences, explain to me how you remember the specific interaction. So we provide structure, we become uh, the couple's uh, auxiliary ego, if you will. If one partner has greater capacity than the other, the person with lower capacity needs to be considered and a special effort needs to be made to not have this person exceed their capacities. We don't want to blow anyone out of the waters. Uh, the different faces of ISTDP inform couples therapy, which I will soon get to, by the way. They often overlap and bleed into each other. 
crystallizing. That was the term that Marvin Scorman liked to use. Uh, it means summarizing the distilled and condensed essence of the dynamics in play in the situation at hand. So whether you call it recapping or anchoring or consolidating or what my former teacher, right, Marvin used to call it crystallizing, the act of summarizing the distilled and condensed essence of the dynamics at play in what is being learned, it's critical at every juncture of treatment. This anchors the treatment in clarity around every step of the session. It ensures collaboration. It appears to fuel both the conscious and the unconscious alliances. The clients will feel understood. It gives clients a chance to correct the therapist. It creates an organizing framework, which is critical for coherent narratives and overall cohesion of the therapeutic interventions, as opposed to just a scatter plot of disjointed factoids and observations. So this ensures that clarity is facilitated at every step along the way. In practice, this means that a handful of umbrella categories or headlines are created uh, and consequent observations are linked to these umbrella categories or headlines. The headlines tend to center on how clients defend or avoid or defeat themselves, as well as particular themes and triggers of emotions, such as not being taken seriously, feeling invisible, abandoned, and other hot button precipitating themes that are emotionally charged and raw for a given client. Examples of the kind of crystallizing and consolidating recaps that may take place in a couples therapy session. Uh, I will offer that right now. Uh, this, uh, this was inspired from a um, heterosexual couple who had an agreement to be monogamous, but where the uh, female dealt with her anger by cheating and being dishonest. Um, so these are extracted sentences. They don't capture an actual session. Um, here goes. Therapist to the fella. It seems like you're not happy with the way things are because she's involved with other men. And then therapist to the female now. And you don't seem unhappy with that at all. You seem like th you seem to like things the way they are with you having relations with other men. That's OK with you. And you're actually only unhappy that he's unhappy about it. So when he does something that makes you angry, you don't deal with it directly. You go to problem solving mode, then you withdraw, and then you go to other men and violate your agreement to be faithful. So just crystallizing her triangle of conflict at that point. Uh, is this just in your relationship that you deal with your anger like this? Or has this been the case for a long time in other relationships as well? Crystallizing the fact that this is likely a pattern. Is that okay with you? Has that worked out well for you? Or would you prefer to be more direct when you're angry? The patient, no, I want to deal with this. Therapist, so dealing with your anger in these ways has really been an ulcer on your life. And this predates this relationship. And you'll take these patterns into the next relationship unless you deal with it. Crystallizing the reality of these patterns, the cost of these defenses. So it seems like you become emotionally distant when you're angry. You problem solve, then you withdraw, and then you act out in ways that are hurtful to the other person, to your partner. And that's been a disaster for you. Just crystallizing, bringing all of this into bold relief. So now we know that when you're angry, there's a part of you that wants to be hurtful. And this was your way of expressing that impulse to be involved with other men and not honest about it. Was it the first time? So it seems like that what you could do to make the relationship better is precisely the same thing you would want to do whether or not you were in this relationship or not. To make your own life better, this is to get buy-in and to make sure that I'm not asking her to be an extension of the partner, uh, that this can actually make her own life better as well. And to disabuse her of the notion that if she just stops seeing other guys, all will be fine that this is a more deep-seated pattern and that she may want to consider trying to get to the bottom of it for her own sake. Patient, anger is not one of my better emotions. I don't deal with it well. Therapist, would you like to learn how to deal with it better than how you deal with it now? So staying very snug and close in 
on the immediate dynamic at hand and bringing that into bold relief, that is crystallizing or anchoring. The phases of the couples therapy, first phase, inquiry. We find out what changes each of them are envisioning if couples therapy were to be successful, clarify their respective priorities uh, and ensure that they know that the priorities can be different. Um, is there common ground on what they want to be different? Does that common ground fall within the parameters of what couples therapy can do? Um, where there is no common ground, clarify that the issue is not likely to change. Where there is common ground, explore specific examples of the problems. You want to listen for themes. You want to listen for the precipitating factors, the triggers. Uh, clarify each of their respective perspectives. Did I get that right? Here's what I've heard you say so far. Did I understand that accurately? Distinguish between resolving disagreements versus resolving how they handle and communicate around disagreements. Some disagreements cannot be resolved. And find out, you want to find out if the couple still finds it worthwhile to improve how they communicate around irreconcilable differences, even if the underlying substantive disagreement and difference cannot change. You, you don't want to assume that all clients and couples will find it worthwhile to work on the process of communication if the substantive difference and disagreement about the subject matter cannot be changed. So for example, uh, child rearing practices, views on what constitutes cheating and so on. Phase two, defense work. Here is where we put each of the partners on their own respective triangles of conflict. Uh, we help them see their own individual contributions to the emotional distancing. Uh, we here want to link the chief complaints, the presenting problems, to their defenses, to what they do to distance. You will want to propose a dynamic formulation of the problems that equates distancing behaviors with their problems. You want to find if you can uh, get consensus on this way of conceptualizing the problems. You're going to want to try to attempt to turn each of them against their own uh, distancing behaviors, against their defenses. And you're going to want to pitch an alternative. The alternative will always involve emotionally intimate ways of relating. Uh, seek consensus on the suggested new way of relating and behaving from each. So making sure that the suggestion is preferable for each partner. So for example, therapist to partner who talks down to his wife. Do you think the odds of her being there for you, which you say is important to you, would be better if instead of talking down to her, you calmly expressed your anger in a sentence or two and explain why? His response, yeah, I think that would be better for me. That would increase those odds. And then the therapist would then want to turn to the wife who's being talked down to. Would it be preferable for you as well? So when both part, when and if both partners are in agreement that a suggested alternative to the defensive way of relating is preferable and that they aspire to work towards the more emotionally intimate vision that's being suggested, that's when a conscious therapeutic alliance is cemented in couples therapy. The therapist will describe emotionally intimate ways of relating in a way that captures the truth of each respective point of view, but converting the perspective into behavior stripped of anxiety and defense. I'm going to say that one more time. The therapist will describe emotionally intimate ways of relating in a way that captures the truth of each respective point of view but converting the perspective into behavior stripped of anxiety and defense. This accomplishes both conveying what types of ways of relating the treatment is shooting for, while also driving home differentiation between feelings, emotionally intimate behavior um, from anxiety and defensive ways of relating. So this way of working also constitutes a form of portraiting emotional closeness. Defenses being addressed may be in real time or they may be out of session, not in real time. Some couples are not very defended in real time. 
and defenses do not crop up so much in actual session, uh, leaving most of the work in the current or past corners on the triangle of person. At some point, though, most couples will have real-time defenses crop up, and that allows for a more experiential focus. Work in the transference. That takes place if one or both of the partners become defensive or less than collaborative with a therapist, and or if one or both partners blame the partner for their own defensive responses. So, for example, partner A, well, of course I get prickly. Look at how she nags and puts me down. Therapists can then point out that the therapist is not nagging or putting down partner A, and yet partner A is prickly with a the therapist too, which means that partner B might make a good cover for partner A to point to and blame for their prickly behavior, but the truth is that the defensive way of being cannot be pinned on partner B, as partner A exhibits this behavior with a the therapist as well. The therapist can also point out that the prickly behavior also likely predates the current relationship, which again casts doubt on the defense of blaming the other for the defensive reaction. Now, having said that, uh, we absolutely allow for the fact that the other may very well be responsible for how we feel, happy, angry, sad, hurt, etc. But how we as adults deal with our emotions is 100% on us. It's our responsibility. Uh, the couple typically mobilize each other. There's often very little need for the therapist to apply a lot of pressure. Um, plus, we often get enough therapeutic mileage from low to medium rise in feelings to accomplish the couple's therapy goals. Remember, we're not aiming for major character change and a total resolution of neuroses in this format. Uh, this is another reason there is often no real need for the therapist to apply heavy pressure. Challenge of defenses, casting doubt on dysfunctional strategies. For example, what are the odds that he's going to want to be there for you when you lecture him? Uh, the head-on collision, clarifying reality. For example, the possibility that something is not looking like it's going to change. Lack of common ground. I don't see a path forward. Uh, a given issue is simply not likely to change. Clarifying the reality of the consequences of a given position. This is especially important when a partner takes a position that is antithetical to emotional closeness and intimacy and very much jeopardizes the accomplishment of the therapeutic goals. The working through phase, uh, this phase takes place when the foundational work on defenses has been done. Uh, the conscious therapeutic alliances are in place. Uh, the couple, they've been turned against their defenses. Uh, and here then, sessions consist of two primary tasks, working through deeper and more intense affect and or the therapist offering a running commentary on the couple's interactions continuously modeling, here's what it would sound like if the two of you were being emotionally intimate right now. The repetition of driving this home ensures that the new skills go into the couple's implicit memory systems and it becomes part of new habits. And then the termination phase, the couple enter sessions with most of their difficulties resolved. It becomes clear to everyone that there's just not much left to work on. Uh, one or both of the partners might be anxious about terminating as couples, um, uh, as couples therapy has become associated with the couple managing to turn fundamental corners in the relationship. But assuming there's nothing left to work on, we say goodbye. Uh, some couples, they come back from time to time for tune-up sessions. And now we've entered the application section of our presentation. This is the juicy, exciting stuff. Uh, keep in mind that the excerpts of the transcripts are really extracted from the overall context. So this is like a, an appetizer or, or a tapas where you get a little vignette, uh, but it's really not meant to capture the whole context. So I probably won't introduce too much about the background information and the uh, chief complaints and so on and so forth, but really just to impart a flavor. Sam and Pam is entirely uh, made up, fictional, and uh, we'll, we'll just jump right in. Therapist. So she knows what she can expect moving forward. Are you okay with dealing with your anger in this way, haranguing her in this way? Or do you aspire to change how you communicate your anger? So this is a clarification uh, of the distinction, critical distinction between anger and how the anger is dealt with. 
uh, seeking clarification on Sam's position and what he wants, which includes a soft challenge, really. Soft because I'm not directly saying that Sam should change, but still casting doubt on the defense by asking the question in this way. All defense work, by the way, whenever we're identifying defenses, it really includes a soft challenge. Um, that's just how it is. Anyway, Sam eventually clarified his position, which was that if sufficiently provoked, he, he really was good with haranguing her, uh, but not before taking umbrage with my approach. So this was quite a character. Uh, I followed up uh, by letting Pam know that given Sam's position, she can expect more of the same, uh, given that he does not aspire to change. So what am I doing? I'm reflecting back the logical consequences of Sam's position to allow Pam to make an informed choice and to bring into bold relief the consequences of Sam's position. So this falls under the umbrella category of, category of clarification work, but it includes a soft pressure on Sam to own his position and live with the consequences and pressure on Pam to really be aware of the reality at hand. So here Sam becomes combative. He says, I'm throwing him under the bus. I told him calmly, well, no such thing is actually happening. And that I'm just reflecting back the implications of his statements. So blocking the defense of seeing himself as my victim, which was his projection of his own superego. Um, and then soft pressure to face the implication of his stated position. Now, the bickering between them is ramping up. Therapist, you both seem angry. Can you just explain to me what you're angry at each other for? I just want to understand. So blocking the defense of bickering, regulating anxiety by inserting myself in the manner that I just described um, and, uh, and seeking clarity, right? Seeking clarity. What are they angry at each other for? Sam goes first. Sam, I'm angry at her for taking attention away from the issue that's important to me and back to her. Um, this is explored to some extent. This is actually happening. Okay, yes, sometimes it does happen. Uh, that emerges from our investigation. Therapist, okay, so you're angry at her for that. Anything else that you're angry at her for? Sam, times when she's playing the victim card, when she's manipulative, that again takes away from my needs. Uh, bracket, uh, there's some projection here. He tends to actually play the victim card. Um, anyway, he elaborates and reports that he's angry at her for not more selflessly, joyously attending to his needs. Therapist, so you're angry at her for not more joy joyfully taking care of your needs, which you have a right to feel. But that sounds like you're talking about a mother, not a partner. That, that's what mothers live for, you know, ideally, taking care of their children's needs, uh, but not in a relationship, right? In a relationship, it goes back and forth. You take care of each other 50-50, bracket. So this intervention recaps, crystallizes Sam's position, supports that he has a right to feel the way he does, but clarifies the implication of his position, which amounts to a soft challenge. Soft, because again, I'm not directly telling him uh, not to be this way. Uh, I'm also leaning into uh, the past, the past corner on Sam's triangle of person. Uh, some discussion takes place, and then therapist. It sounds like you're wanting her to make up for what you didn't get from your mother, which you have a right to want and which you have a right to be angry about. But we should be honest that that is what you're angry about, bracket. This intervention is a pressure on Sam to own and be honest about the truth of what he wants. Sam. Well, this is textbook psychology, oversimplified. This, this sounds like something you got out of a textbook. Therapist, well, let's not get the textbooks. I mean, is it true or isn't it true? So challenge in that I try to block the defense of dismissing my interpretation and pressure to be truthful. Sam, I'm not at all prepared to say that's true. Therapist, meaning you disagree? Simple clarification around Sam's position. Sam. Yeah, I think you're wrong. Therapist turning to Pamela and asking her, does this make sense to you? He doesn't see it this, he doesn't see it the way I see it. How do you see it? Does what I say make sense to you? Pamela, yeah, it very much makes sense to me. Therapist to Pamela. So how do you account for him not seeing it, looking to draw Pamela out and get her views? Pamela, I have no idea. He doesn't want to look at it that way. Therapist. So the two of you are really far apart on this. You, Pamela, see it as true, and you, Sam, do not. 
So this is one more area where there doesn't seem to be much common ground to Sam. I see it, she sees, she sees it, you don't see it. And yet it seems to be a common dynamic that you're ang a common dynamic that you're angry at her for not taking more joy in taking care of you. Bracketing. Here I'm crystallizing, recapping the situation we're finding ourselves in and the implication, which is that they are far apart. And again, reiterating Sam's position and what it implies, uh, which is both a pressure to be honest and a soft challenge. Uh, remember, any kind of defense work uh, incorporates soft challenge. It's, it's uh, built in. Okay. Therapist to Sam. Do you take joy in taking care of her? Sam. I try. Absolutely. I try so much. I'm depleted. It's a labor of love. Uh, but yes, I feel I give a lot. Uh, I help her process. I listen a lot. A therapist. Is that a source of joy for you? Sam. Well, yes and no. I mean, it's a labor of love. Therapist. But you said joy. Is it a source of joy for you? Sam. Well, no, not always. Therapist. So you are also not always joyful about taking care of her. Okay, fair. So this line of questioning constitutes a soft challenge and more pressure on Sam to try to be honest. Therapist, but you want that from her, that she should be joyful in taking care of you. That's why I'm saying that it doesn't sound like a partnership. It sounds like something else because it's not equal. Uh, this is not an adult relationship. You're not describing an adult relationship where she should be joyful in taking care of you, uh, but it's not a problem if you're not joyful in taking care of her. Bracketing now, this is gentle but relentless pressure and challenge to for Sam to see the truth and to own the truth of what his position really implies. Sam, Okay, it's true. I'm tired of feeling ashamed of how much I want to be taken care of. I mean, that's how I am, all right? Therapist. Well, that's okay. I'm not saying that you shouldn't want that or that you shouldn't be angry about not getting those wants met. I'm just saying that there seems to be a core dynamic between the two of you, that you want her to be an extension of you, the mother you never had. You're allowed to want that. I just want us all together to be clear and honest that this is what is going on bracketing, pressure to be honest while making it clear that I'm not asking him to change this. This undoes projections. Therapist turning to Pamela, and maybe that's okay with you. Maybe you don't mind being treated like you should be in the role of his mother. Maybe that's okay with you. Bracketing, seeking clarification on Pam's position about being on the receiving end of this behavior dynamic. Pamela, no, I really hate that. Therapist, is that what you're angry at him for, treating you this way? Pamela, absolutely. This is exactly what it is. Pamela appears riveted as I engage Sam, seemingly appreciative that the issue is being addressed. Therapist turning to Sam. So is it reasonable that she hates that? Is that a reasonable reaction, Sam? No, she really should not feel that way. I, I give so much. I think she should give more. Therapist. Well, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, who should give more has actually nothing to do with what we're talking about. Nothing at all. Why are you bringing that up? Sam remains silent. Therapist, we're talking about her not taking joy in taking care of you, like a mother would take joy, or a father for that matter. And you not always taking joy in taking care of her. That's what we're talking about. Not who gives the most, which is a different subject. We're talking about that you're angry at her for not taking joy in taking care of you, but you don't either. Uh, but she should, which doesn't sound like a partnership. It sounds like a mother-child relationship or father-child father, -child for that matter, right? But right now, given these dynamics, this is what I say. It's the mother's job to take care of the child, but not the child's job to take care of the mom. Sam takes a slight sigh and he nods. The intervention constitutes challenge of Sam's defense of diversification and trying to change the subject and deflect and pressure on Sam's denial and the implication of his position. Therapist again to Sam. So how long have you been in relationships where your partner doesn't take, take joy in taking care of you? How, how far back does that go? Does that go back to your mom? Did she take joy in taking care of you? Did she light up when you walked into the room? Sam, 
<sighs> yeah, I mean, this goes back a long way. Therapist. So it's understandable that you'd want that in your adult relationships because you didn't get it as a kid. It's understandable that you're mad that when you don't get it. I assume you're mad at your mother for not taking more joy in taking care of you. Sam, oh, <clears throat> well, that's uh, that's very touchy. I don't know if I can go there. Therapist, oh, so you mean you can be angry with Pamela, but you mean you don't feel angry at your mother for not taking joy in being a mother. Sam nods. So how long have you been pushing those feelings away? Sam shrugs. So it seems like you're displacing that anger onto Pamela, like you acknowledge, like you actually acknowledged in our first session, instead of feeling your anger towards your mother. Yeah. So is that really how you want to spend the rest of your life? Do you want to do that for the rest of your life? Sam's response is noncommittal and evasive. Um, so that'll be the end here for Sam and Pam. Uh, if you want the entire write-up, uh, give me a shout out, email me, and I'll happily send it to you, assuming you're a mental health professional. All right, Amanda and Mick. This is this is the couple uh, where their relationship was characterized by a tremendous amount of instability and chaos, and uh, I was able to be of some service to them, but really not much help at all. And, uh, and that's important to showcase. So here goes a therapist to Amanda when she goes through the la laundry list of, of not wanting mixed support. Therapist, so your anger seems valid. It isn't your feelings that's the problem, but I'm wondering if you're conscious that you're dealing with your feelings in a way that conveys that he has no redeeming qualities as a human being. That may not be how you feel or your intention, but it is how you're coming across bracket commentary so differentiating valid feelings from the defensive way that they're handled identifying the defense of monsterizing while acknowledging that this is just how she comes across and that it may not be what she's intending to do amanda uh well i don't have these skills therapist i'm not telling you to do anything different just that this is how you come across like he has no redeeming qualities as a partner amanda this is too much feedback. I, I don't know if I want to let him close to me. This is too much for me. Therapist. Well, maybe you don't want anything to do with me either then. Amanda. Well, for now, I'm really overwhelmed, okay? Oh, can you follow me? Amanda. Um, well, I got a headache. I mean, no one was in my corner when I was a kid. Well, maybe I'm playing the victim card bracketing right so when i ask her if she can follow me i'm assessing whether or not she has cognitive perceptual disruption uh, but there was some stride of signaling and so probably not therapist well that is your right if she wants to play the victim card that's her prerogative well that is your right it doesn't look like you want to let anybody close to you but it's a free country you can do that so should i continue talking to him for now would that be okay therapist to make how are you reacting? Do you think that there's any truth in what I'm saying, or do you disagree in terms of how she's coming across? Mick, uh, let's switch focus. Therapist, so it's not that you're disagreeing with me, but the two of you really don't want to face this today. It's too much to face. Bracketing, commenting, just seeking clarification. Is this what's happening? Is this the situation we find ourselves in? So much of crystallizing. It's just about here's the situation we're finding ourselves in. Mick, um, well, maybe we could just brainstorm about like <clears throat> having a date night or something. Therapist, sure, go ahead. Bracketing, commenting, avoiding a battle of wills, clarifying that they will be driving this agenda. The couple bicker and the picture uh, emerging is one where their lives are in complete chaos. Therapist. So there's this dynamic in your relationship of lurching from crises to crises and keeping things in chaos, which impacts each of you and your relationship with your son. And I thought that that wasn't a good thing. So I've been working on trying to help you both give that up and learn more adaptive ways of relating to each other. But maybe that is too much anxiety. Maybe you prefer the distance that the chaos creates. Maybe that is what you prefer. And it's a free country. So bracketing, commenting, crystallizing the main theme, that they both create chaos in the relationship as a way to distance, 
being open about how I see things and what I have tried to do, while making it clear that I understand that they may not be interested and making it clear that they are free to reject my vision for change, which undoes unconscious defiance, among other things. Couple, no, no, just not right now. Therapist, so you mean you want to deal with the chaos in later sessions, but not now? So bracketing, seeking clarification and a soft challenge of procrastination. Uh, Amanda, <clears throat> he's such a schmuck, such a terrible person. I, I don't want his support. I, I won't accept what he has to offer. He, he has no redeeming qualities. You, you put it well, you honest. So formulation, she wants me to hate him as much as he does. I mean, she wants me to hate him as much as she hates him. Therapist, it sounds like you want me to dislike him as much as you do. You're giving me all these reasons for why I should be on your side and think that he's a schmuck. It's fine if you want that, but that seems to be what you want. So bracket, comment. The task here, okay, support her feelings first and then gently cast doubt on her defense while stressing her autonomy, but with pressure to be honest. Therapist, it's not like your feelings are a problem, but how you're dealing with them comes across like you see him as not having any redeeming qualities, which you're now stating. I'm not telling you not to do it. If you want to do it, fine. If not, we can look at alternatives. But this is how you're coming across. If that's okay with you, that's okay. Again, soft challenge while supporting her autonomy, letting her know that she could choose an alternative. The accepting stance is to undo the unconscious defiance and not become another person in her life telling her what to do. Amanda, I don't even know if I want to support therapist. Yeah, you come across as feeling that way because you see him as a schmuck, not having redeeming qualities. Amanda, I'm, I'm too overwhelmed. I, I don't want more feedback. Therapist, sounds like you have a lot to think about. Therapist to Mick, so how do you feel about what I said? You agree or disagree? Mick, well, let's just talk about a date night. Therapist, it sounds like you want to gloss over this, which is fine. Uh, commentary, bracketing off here. The idea here is that if only they can have a date night, they won't have to deal with this. So back to my intervention. So go ahead, negotiate a date night. Do your thing. Comment. I'm avoiding a battle of wills. I'm ensuring anxiety does not get too high. So the task here is to identify the reality of things without insisting that they change and with a tone that conveys that it's okay. That this, this gives the observations that I make a chance to sink in. I'm not assuming that they want to be emotionally close and to deal with things. I stay with a simple, well, this is how I see it, or this is how it looks from where I'm sitting. The needle to thread is to, on the one hand, not allow clients to manipulate us, to manipulate us into not speaking about the main thing going on, while on the other hand, not insisting that they need to change. That's the sweet spot. Couple, uh, th this is just too much right now. Therapist, no problem. Let's talk about it next time then. So here it would be a mistake to try to make order out of chaos instead of trying to bring order to it. I just point out the disorder. They haven't signed off on giving up the chaos. So um, the following here are a few of my main interventions that followed, very, very much extracted from the transcript as a whole, of course. This is primarily to impart a flavor and give a sense for my therapeutic stance in the formulation that I shared with the couple. So this is not really a transcript. This is to impart a flavor of the formulation that I kept coming back to, that I kept sharing with the couple as a form of crystallizing, here's the situation we seem to be finding ourselves in. That, by the way, regulates anxiety and offers insight and clarity uh, and, and honors their autonomy, which is critical. Anyway, therapist. So do you want to work on having your life being less chaotic? There might be things out of your hands, sure, but there may be things that you do have some control over that you could do for your life to be less chaotic. Would you like to explore that and see if there are things that you could do and then work on the chaos that you create? And then on the heels of a great deal of instability and chaos. Therapist. So look, therapy is not magic. It presumes a certain level of stability and, and certainty in your life. 
You, you really can't do an archaeological dig in the middle of an earthquake. It seems to me that the hallmark of your life is chaos. Even getting it together to join a virtual session, which you know ahead of time, descends into chaos. Therapist, the hallmark of your lives and the hallmark of the most destructive force in your relationship is chaos, where nothing is constant, where everything is always changing. People are getting kicked out. There are lies. One week we're on for therapy, another week we table it. There's no structure. There's no constancy, which is essential for a relationship and certainly to be parents. Even getting ready for our sessions, which you know about in advance, you're never ready. There is chaos. So therapy cannot work under those conditions. You cannot do archaeological digs in the middle of an earthquake. Uh, the chaos takes various forms. Not having understandings about your finances, whether or not Mick is actually a guest or not. Kicking Mick out of the car, snatching his phone away, Mick walking home for miles without his phone. Then you break up. Then you're not breaking up. You're back together. Ending therapy. And then not ending therapy. There is constant chaos. That is the essential thing that needs to be dealt with first before anything else can happen, not only in your therapy, but in your relationship and in your lives in general. Therapy won't help until we deal with the chaos, right? You got to be ready. 8.15 a.m. sharp. That's when we start. And what gets in the way of that bracket? What gets in the way of that is what makes a wreck out of their relationship and their lives. Therapy assumes that you have a place to live, right? You have to be able to show up for appointments on time, heat, electricity, food, all those basic needs. Chaos is how this couple distance from each other. Um, commentary, it, it became important not to address every individual defense, but to simply say, so this is another way you create chaos rather than being emotionally intimate. Like each of the items, each of their behaviors, each of their defenses are just the same. It's just another version of chaos. It's all in the service of creating chaos. So my job at this point was not to uh, identify individual defenses, but to link every single thing in, under this large umbrella category, which really captured the essence of both of their major columns of defense. Therapist, your life is chaotic. Your relationship is chaotic. Even just showing up on time for an appointment, there's always something that gets in the way of that. We're constantly scrambling and dealing with chaos, lurching from one crisis to the next. When I provide structure, the chaos does not take over our sessions. The only thing that works here is when I become like a parent, but I'm not there all the time. So this is what I'm doing. I'm interrupting chaotic responses. If that's what it takes for a while, that's fine. But I just want to be clear that that is what I'm doing. Otherwise, sessions descend into chaos like your lives. Um, I just stayed steady and just continue to reiterate that this was all in the service of creating chaos, a way to avoid feelings. And if that's what they wanted to do, I could live with it. Uh, so that's how I tried to uh, undo uh, the battle of wills and all of that stuff. Eventually, the couple dropped out, but they did gain significant insight and some increased capacity. But was I able to help them a great deal? No, I was not. So enter Tom and Maria. Same thing here, right? These are extractions. Very much devoid from the overall context. Uh, but hopefully, it'll impart a flavor. So therapist turning to Maria. Do you really want to continue to scold and micromanage him? Is that working for you? Therapist to Tom, do you really want to continue to be dismissive towards her and call her names? So the main way in which each create distance had been identified and put, uh, and I hear I'm putting them at choice, right? Do you want to continue to engage your major column of defense, basically, and distance in these ways or not? Therapist to Maria. So you have this plan for how to move to this new location, but how does he feel about talking about it? Maria, well, he doesn't, he doesn't want to. He keeps blowing me off. Therapist, well, how do you know? Maria, well, he blows me off. Tom, it's fine. Therapist to Tom, so you are blowing her off. You're not saying how you really feel about it. It's fine, isn't saying how you, whether you agree or disagree or how you feel about it or that you think it should be done some other way. So... If she were to approach you and say, I would really like it if you uh, could share your thoughts about the move. Here's what I'm thinking, but how would that be for you? Um, what would be your response? Tom, oh, really, it's fine. Whatever she wants to do. Keep in mind, Tom tends to complain that he experiences 
her, Maria, as violating his autonomy. Keep that in mind. So therapist to Tom. So when I role play and ask you, if she asked you the way that I did, you don't say how you really feel. You're vague, evasive, and passive. So with that in mind, why would she ask you how you feel if you're going to give her that kind of an answer, unless you don't want, unless you don't want to be included? When I offer you a role play where she's respecting your autonomy, you're the one that gives up your autonomy by not saying how you really feel, by not taking a position on the question, right? Again, he tends to complain that she violates his autonomy. The only person giving up your autonomy is you. She couldn't take away your autonomy even if she tried. You're an adult. Do you see how you give up on your autonomy and then become a victim of her? It's a bracket. Commentary, defense identification, pressure to see his defensive pattern, and then casting doubt on his defense of blaming Maria for his loss of autonomy. Tom, well, I, I do, I do see that now that you say it. Therapist, I'm guessing you have been doing that for a while. Therapist to Maria, you know, this is what he does. He gives up his autonomy. He invites you to take charge of the planning and then whines about it and becomes a victim. However, you exploit that so you can get things done. You didn't create it, but you do exploit it. So I'm clarifying this dynamic. Maria, well, I don't want to pick the dates because if something goes wrong, he, he'll blame me. The therapist, yeah, that's right, because he doesn't take a stand. And then if something goes wrong, then he's the victim because he has not okayed it. He doesn't say, I think those dates are a good idea, or I think those or these dates would actually be better. Maria, that's right therapist. Yeah, that seems true. That's what I'm observing as well. But instead of trying to get him to do that, why don't you just say, here's what I think. What do you think? And if he blows you off, you can say, that makes me mad because you're not taking a position. You're not being a partner. I want to know if you agree or disagree or whatever, but, but it really makes me mad when you take a passive uninvolved position. So you can blame me if something goes wrong. It's really unfair. And you're the one giving up your autonomy by not really getting involved in the decision process. It has nothing to do with me at all. Bracketing, commenting. So this is pitching an alternative, offering a behavioral suggestion that contrasts with her current defensive behavior. Maria, that sounds good, but he often says I'm bossy. Therapist to Maria. Uh, well, you do come across as bossy sometimes. I've seen that here on a few occasions. But instead, you could simply say, here's what I would like to do. How about you? Maybe you have a different idea. That would be much easier than being bossy or trying to get him to engage. So commenting, this is a light acknowledgement of Tom's perception of Maria as bossy, right? If anything is true, it deserves to be acknowledged. Um, and then I'm pitching an alternative. Maria, I think you have a point. Therapist, would it not be easier for you just to say, here's what I would like, how would that be for you? And then when he's passive and uninvolved, you can just say that you're mad at him for not taking a position. Now down the road, uh, Tom is now talking down to Maria, therapist to Tom. You're talking to her as if she has no redeeming qualities as a salesperson, uh, that she's just a total failure and an asshole. Tom looks at me, slight look of recognition. Therapist, you pull rank, like your opinion counts more than hers. And if she does not agree with you, you talk to her as if there's something really wrong with her. This stops dialogue and ensures that she will not be there for you, that you will not be heard, which was your childhood. See, you're your own worst enemy when it comes to not being heard. So to bracket that. So there, because I knew about his childhood, that had come up. I could make that link to the past on his triangle of person. And I can do that while underscoring the cost of his defensive approach, that he's basically recreating his own childhood of not being heard and not being acknowledged. Tom sighs, looks down. Therapist, this is what I feel end of discussion. And you, to her, you're an asshole, less than if you disagree with me. Tom, that's how you talk to her. And then Tom, yeah, I, I don't know. Therapist, like there's something terribly wrong with you if you disagree with me, that your opinion is be all end all. Do you see how this leaves you alone, unheard and unacknowledged, just like you were as a child? 
So identifying Tom's defensive way of relating and underscoring the cost to him. Tom sighs, tears up a bit. I do see it now, he says. Therapist. So what's better, to be defensive or to acknowledge that reasonable people can disagree and that you can see why she would be mad at you? And then, and then increase the odds that she will acknowledge your feelings too. How much of that have you had in your life, by the way, where people said that they can understand why you would be mad? Tom. Not much. Therapist. Well, it's never going to happen if you continue to communicate like this. You're your own worst enemy in terms of being heard and acknowledged. But you weren't conscious of it. But I was hoping to make it conscious so you can see that this is not in your best interest either. Even though she would like it if you changed, that's not why I'm suggesting you change. This is because it would make your life easier. Bracketing, commenting. So defense identification and trying to turn Tom against his defenses, stressing that this would be uh, better for him personally, even though Maria would also prefer it. Tom, but I do have higher rank. Therapist, see that puts an end to any dialogue here. I do have higher rank as a conversation stopper. Is that really what you want to do? Commentary. Instead of getting tangled up in the content and the merits of the claim, I simply identify that this way of relating puts an end to any prospect of emotional closeness and dialogue. Tom, well, I really do think she needs to get better at her job. I mean, Maria, you suck in so many ways, Maria. And, and to be frank, you deserve to be talked to that way. Therapist to Maria. Well, he seems to be okay to demean you like this. He has no intentions of changing the way he talks to you, and he thinks you deserve that. How is that for you? Commentary. Instead of trying to get Tom to be different, turning to Maria and clarifying that this is how he wants to be, and inviting her to respond. Maria. I hate it so much. Therapist. I don't blame you. So on the heels of Tom taking over sessions and repeating himself, having already reflected back to him his essential message, where he now knows that he's been heard, but yet he continues to take over uh, the sessions and, and uh, go on tirades and monologues. Therapist to Tom, well, is this really how you want to live your life? Talking a mile a minute, talking in circles, repeating yourself even, even when you're being heard. You realize this is you taking over. Tom, well, well, I have ADHD. Therapist, well, that doesn't answer the question. Is this how you want to be? People with ADHD are not recalcitrant. We can work at this. Do you want to work at this so you can feel heard more often because you're recreating the pain of your childhood? Okay, that was them. Shifting gears now, Lucy and James. And again, remember, these are like tapas little vignettes to impart a flavor. They're not actual transcripts. They're devoid of, of, the, of every single back and forth, every single comment. I'm just extracting uh, some of the back and forth and some of my interventions to impart a flavor. Uh, James wants to resolve that they see things differently. Therapist. Well, can we see an example of how that's a problem for you in your marriage? Asking for specific examples. And then therapist to Lucy. Do you have different things you want to resolve? He thinks the main problem is differences in perception. Do you have a different idea why that you're here and what you'd like to work on? So bracketing, clarifying here that Lucy is not an extension of James and she may have different priorities. Well, yeah, she does. Lucy wants to address what she perceives as James being controlling and punishing her for attending to the needs of her teenage son. Therapist, so you both want to work on, th on different things. Let's see what comes out of this. Therapist to James. <clears throat> so there are times her son is the priority and you have feelings about it. She's a mother, so she's divided. James, well, I want, her, I want to be her main priority. Therapist, you mean you want to always be the priority and never the son? Yep. Well, she's a mother as well, and there will be times when her son is the priority. James, but she should not have talked to her ex. <clears throat> Therapist, well, she didn't hide it from you. Therapist to Lucy. So what is your thinking about this incident? Lucy shares her view, which is that she wants to keep relations with her son's father for the sake of her son. Therapist to James. So she has these relationships that at times are going to be part of your life. 
If that's not acceptable to you, you can be honest with her and let her know. You can be mad about it, but that is part of what she's bringing to the table. James, not acceptable. Therapist. So there is an impasse here. What he wants, which is for you not to have primary primary relationships with your son and his relatives, is something you're not willing to do, Lucy. Even though James is the main person in your life, there are these other relationships that you're not willing to cut off. So it looks like there's an impasse here. What he wants from you, you're not willing to do. Uh, you won't tune out your son or your ex-in-law. And that's the nature of being a parent. James, well, I'm not okay with this. Therapist, well, I think this is an impasse. I don't see how couples counseling can help. James, well, it's a problem for me that she doesn't see it my way. Therapist, well, I know, but it's not a problem for her. Again, there's an impasse. Well, can't you help us with this? It's an impasse. Well, can you resolve it? Well, no, it's an impasse. This is how it's going to be. The question is, do you want to stay and try to work out a relationship with this as a given that she's going to have a relationship with others and her son will sometimes be a priority over you? The question is, do you want to continue to have a relationship with, with her given that this is the case, given that that's not going to change? Therapist. I can help you work out a relationship, but it would be a relationship based on this basic fact that this is how it is. Her son's needs will be more immediate than yours sometimes. Do you want to work out a relationship with that as a given? Or is that a deal killer for you? Unacceptable. Therapist. Well, okay. Then I don't see a way around this. Therapist. <clears throat> see, this is not going to change, nor should it. So given that this is how it's going to be, do you want to work on a relationship with that as a given or do you want to move on? So pressure on James to make a choice. James, well, how could that work? I'm so upset. Therapist, well, you have your feelings and she understands why you feel that way. And maybe we can work on understanding why that is so difficult for you. I mean, there's some reason that goes beyond what meets the eye. I mean, she is a mother. You can't expect her to abandon her son. Uh, so there are two ways uh, to go, and they're not mutually exclusive. One is to help you, James, have your feelings about it and let those feelings be part of the relationship, but not try to change her. Just feel how you feel and allow her close to you. And the second is to see what else this may be triggering inside of you about your own life. That is uh, because this is such an intense reaction that you have. Uh, so those are two ways that I can see. Uh, no, so those are two ways I can see that you can continue to have a relationship. Well, anyway, James ended up firing me. It's just what happens sometimes. All right, so that was the end of the application section. Um, anticipated critiques. Um, my approach to ISTDP informed couples therapy, uh, it does not work with the unconscious enough. It's overly cognitive and behavioral to be considered ISTDP informed. Um, Challenging defenses without a high rise of feelings can deflate the process and precipitate clients to collapse. In my response, my response is that, well, the proof is in the pudding, and I am sure that my work can be improved upon always, but I am actually rather pleased with my track record. So that brings us to the end. Uh, thank you for watching, and I hope it was useful. Till next time.